two things. One is a very kind of broad, top-level idea that I would encourage all of us, or especially those of you who are working in what I like how Hassan uses, uses this term, creative industries here in Ghana. Um, but I think that there are, there's this kind of top-level idea that we can continue to do more to aspire to, uh, which is more or less the idea of stigmergy. Some of you may have heard it before. So I'll speak to that briefly, and then I'll give you just a little bit of an overview about the work we're doing in Akagoshi to help you understand uh, the thinking behind that. Um, so I'm going to try and read this. This is, uh, are, how many of you are bloggers? No one? One, two, three, okay, a few people are bloggers. Um, so I guess this is, this is from the last issue of Harvard Design Magazine, which is sort of looking at uh, architecture, landscape architecture, urban planning, across those disciplines. One of the, the lead articles um, was talking about the relationship between design and, and capital, essentially those people who fund design projects, and they said, you know, there's been some talk and interest, blah, 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 and sort of younger emerging practices. And I said, oh, that's interesting. And I looked in the, the notes, and they had actually quoted a blog post that I had done some years ago. Um, so I wanted to sort of read that, which sort of frames, I think, the work that we're also trying to do. But I think it's also particularly interesting because it just shows you how much the world is changing, that it's no longer sort of, you have to be in these sort of like peer-reviewed academic publications. You just put your ideas out there on the web, and if the ideas are interesting or salient, someone will pick them up, and the conversation just happens. So I'm gonna try and read this. It says, as design students and young architects, I wrote this sort of years ago when I was still in school. Uh, as design students and young architects, landscape architects and urban planners, we felt that design and designers have lost a degree of power, their personal agency, and on behalf of design, at the same time that design often does little to advance the interests of those who have less power and are less likely to be clients. We found the concept of agency helpful because it captured the multiple dimensions of the problem. This was around the same time that we read Michel Provost and Walter van der Fout's article Facts on the Ground, which was in the same magazine, Harvard Design Magazine, and which suggested that there is an emerging, quote, ditch urbanism, model of designers as proactive problem solvers. Based on bottom-up, grassroots efforts from below, design and designers can identify problems and then, as part of the design process, develop creative methods for realizing and build results on the ground. We asked ourselves how we could learn from this targeted approach of design married with vaguely guerrilla tactics. We knew that design should not be exclusive, and we knew that traditional client-based models of practice can have a strained power dynamic that renders architects as prostitutes, turning tricks for commissions and bigger budgets. In response, we argued that we could grow the space within the profession of architecture for an expanded movement to design greater equality into the global power structures built environment. Anyway, so that's just, I guess, sort of a background to some of the work that we're trying to do. This idea, uh, stigmergy, is something which emerges from the world of ants. And some of you may have heard me talk about this before, but essentially, uh, an ant looks like this, right? And it wanders around, and it does its business, blah, 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 blah. And on occasion, ants will come up against other ants, and they have a way of actually communicating, which is signaling. Usually they leave small little drops of scent, and based off of the, the data encoded in those scents, then the other ants can understand there's food behind me, I'm going here, I'm going there, I just saw this, I just saw that. But as scientists studied ant colonies and tried to make sense of, of the work that ants can do, or, or like termites, similarly, you know, they can build these gigantic termite mounds, or ants can you know, destroy an entire tree or eat an animal and all these kinds of things at a huge scale relative to them individually. And what they actually observed is that ants, as a collective, are not hierarchical. So there's a queen ant or something in the, in the colony or whatever, but they don't have layers of managers and middle management and overseers and supervisors that controls all of the actions of the ants. All of the ants are operating individually. And the reality is they're able to create incredibly complex processes because each individual ant will do something and then leave a note about what it did. And all the other ants have access to that information which shows what the other ants have done and collectively through this process which they call stigmergy, um, sort of something which emerges through signs, 
they're able to create very complex things. So this is, uh, as, a, as a very top level idea, essentially it's a, it's a call for all of us to collaborate more and to share more and to tell other people what we're doing and our ideas because I think that this tendency to keep things and hold them close can be counterproductive in this, in this era of a sort of networked and digital age when you can put the information out there, it can spread. So having said that, I think that AMP, which is the Agogoshi Makerspace platform, is an example or an experiment of us trying to do this in, in actuality. Uh, this was a breakout session at Barcamp Accra in December of 2012, where we talked about the maker movement, um, which is kind of like do-it-yourself, but involves digital technology, 3D printing, uh, this idea of co-creation with other people, locally and globally. And, I don't know, a few dozen people were there, we got really excited, and people said, well, what should we do? And unanimously, everyone said, well, let's work with e-waste. You know, this is a problem that's in Ghana, it's almost sort of a national disgrace, um, and there's an opportunity, let's get involved. And we said, that's a great idea, let's do it. And we said, you know, it may take some time, but by all means, if, if our intent is pure, and sort of if it's meant to be, uh, we will find support, it will emerge. And um, sure enough, uh, about a year later, after sort of working and, and sort of making the case for it and various things, we were able to get uh, support to sort of launch a pilot project. And this was an early sketch with actually Ivy and Emmanuel who were here, and we were sort of mapping out the process um, and thinking about how we could take something from an idea and try to build it in something, into something much larger than that idea. Um, which in essence is to say, how can you take the Agogloshi e-waste dump and transform it into a center for digital fabrication? So take something which everyone says is, is a horrible disaster and turn it into an innovation hub. Um, very quickly, we were inspired by this idea of terraforming. This is an awesome art project which reimagines the uh, sort of Zambian space program from the 60s. Um, which didn't actually look like this, but imagine this kind of like retro future of, of Africa um, as a place where, yeah, you can send um, astronauts to Mars or to the moon. Because in reality, there's a concept called terraforming, which is what happens when you go to a planet like Mars, which is not hospitable, hospitable for human life, and you try to make it hospitable for human life, literally turn it into an Earth. And we were inspired by this idea because if you look at, this is, uh, sort of one of the, the seasonal streams that goes into the, the Kolebu Lagoon. On the, the left is Old Fadama, uh, and on the right is, is Agu Goshi going to the Iwe Stum, and there's this sort of lone bridge which crosses. And if you look at these areas, they're actually not fit for human life. I mean, Agu Goshi right now, at least in 2013, was rated the most toxic place on Earth, ahead of Chernobyl in the Ukraine, which is, if you didn't know, is the site of a nuclear meltdown. So it's an incredibly toxic site in the middle of Accra, um, and yet people are living there and also dying there every single day. You can see the, the soil is black from these high concentrations of lead and heavy metals, which is, emerges from people breaking apart electronics, as well as burning copper wires and cables to try and recover the copper. Here, some of the guys are burning. Uh, the top is the site of our makerspace sort of early on as we started to clear it. Um, but what we found equally inspiring is that even though you can understand this as, a, as an almost like a place not fit for human life, there's so much industry happening in it each and every day. Um, not only disassembling and breaking down machines, but people building new equipment and new machinery um, out of those equipments. Um, again, very quickly, our inspiration for the sort of makerspace itself was this idea of a spacecraft. So if you have terraforming, you have to have a spacecraft. This is a, a geodesic dome that was built by students from tech uh, in the 60s under the leadership of Buckminster Fuller, who actually invented the idea of geodesic domes. Um, I have no idea where it is now, or even sort of what happened after this, this moment at the, the trade fair, but you know, this is a moment when you had young people, you had youth in Ghana who were involved in, in technical fabrication that was on the leading edge of what anyone was doing on, in the world. Um, and we believe that this is still something that's very much possible. You just have to decide to do it. Um, other people have done sort of living capsules like this. Um, on the right hand, you can, you can see the figure of a person that's almost two stories tall. Um, or this is more recently in Scandinavia, which is a kind of open source research lab where people live in it and conduct research on the Earth, but in a way that, that sort of uh, approaches how people could do this on other planets. Um, 
in a more sort of extreme form, you have this research lab in Antarctica now, which is actually able to walk as the ice as the ice sort of sinks and moves. Then this this research station actually can can move where it, where it is. In other words, a lot of these kind of imagery and this kind of imaginary of science fiction already exists today. It's happening, um, and it's a question of do we want to get get involved? This is a makerspace from Bangalore where they literally install it, it's almost like scaffolding, um, anywhere they want, and it moves around the city, and hackers occupy it and work together to create all kinds of, you know, tech platforms, etc. Um, some of these images are flicking by our Magudoshi. If you haven't been there, you can see some of what's happening. Um, this is a set of tools that we're working on. So it's really a whole range of, of equipment that allows you to make literally anything that you want. Um, and we're trying to sort of like one by one build these from, from scratch. But just to give you some other kind of examples of, of what we're talking about, this is something that someone's actually made in Agalicia already, which is a satellite receiver. This is a 3D printer that was made in, in Woy Lab in, in Lome, designed by Afat, uh, made out of e-waste, and it's the first 3D printer in Africa. Here's um, jerry cans that they build out of old e-waste uh, in jerry cans, it's sort of refurbished computers. We've made some in Agaloshi as well. Uh, this is a filibot which can take old plastic and melt it down to make filament for 3D printers. This is a solar center which actually takes sand and focuses sunlight to create pottery. Um, and the list goes on and on. This is a, a bicycle powered tool for uh, sort of recovering from printed circuit boards, gold and silver and other precious metals. Uh, a spectroscope, which I is actually here is working on. Um, uh, this is a solar charging station that we developed with students from Stanford. Um, so I showed that to you again because in reality, what we're doing is not something that would conventionally be understood as architecture. Because in reality, we're working on sort of one level beyond or below, which is to say, can we focus on uh, sort of producing the technologies that allow us to make things um, individually? which can eventually together start to create this makerspace where people can make robots, where people can make uh, sort of spectroscopes to understand what the materials are around them. Um, and this is a, uh, a mini kiln which we're making right now. We've actually prototyped already in Agaloshi and allows you essentially to, to melt and reform plastics, glass, and metals such as aluminum. Um, and then sort of here's the sort of makerspace itself, which is actually a prefabricated, scalable, uh, deployable workshop, in essence, um, in which all of these kind of tools and equipment for making things can be housed. Um, and ultimately the goal is to be able to uh, replicate this in the workshop itself and deploy it at other, at other sites in Java. I'll leave it there because of time, but I, I could go on in addition to uh, the digital platform which is also being developed, which allows you to essentially uh, understand the different materials within the e-waste stream, uh, within the electronics, and how you can use them and reconfigure them to make alternate forms of, 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 of equipment. Thank you very much. Uh, let's show some love with this here. So we just allow a few questions. But you can, so you understand what you're saying, right? Just sort of the whole technical stuff that we put in my head. You're trying to see how we can transform our pollution using the e-waste and the products that we can use, that people can use as that constant. Exactly. So, yeah, maybe I went a little bit more into the theory or something, but in essence, uh, oftentimes when, I, when we talk about this project with, with groups or workshops, you can start with the question of, in Ghana, what do we make? I mean, we don't we don't make matches, we don't make toothpicks, we don't make cars, we don't make ceiling fans. We make very, very few things. Um, but there's actually a few things that we do make. For example, we make welding machines, which are very good, and they make them in Agadoshi. So there's actually equipment that is being manufactured in Ghana, and our aim is to say, instead of sort of crying about, oh, there's this horrible, devastating site of pollution, which is true, and it is killing people, and it's, it's a horrible disaster that needs to be sort of handled and addressed, but why can't we sort of look beyond just trying to rectify a problem and say, can we actually leverage the fact that there's very valuable electronic materials coming into Ghana, even though it's illegal, and can we transform them 
into sort of new digital tools and equipment um, for the next century.